Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to our conversation this afternoon with two superstars in the area of Mer American religion. Um, our conversation is entitled, Two Jewish Fathers Who Changed History, Abraham Joshua Heschel and Elie Wiesel. My name is Mark Massa, and I have the privilege of being the director for the Boise Center for Religion and American Public Life here at Boston College. Before we begin, I'd like to make you aware that we are taping this afternoon's panel, and it will be available on our website, which is www.bc.edu backslash Boise, B-O-I-S-I. In light of that, uh, I ask you to please silence all your cell phones. Additionally, I'd like to uh, encourage you to look at our future events. Um, Next Wednesday on November the 2nd, uh, we welcome back to the Boise Center Ward Holder from St. Anselm College to discuss his recent book at a luncheon colloquium entitled Tradition and Its Discontents, John Calvin and the Western Mind. Uh, in the spring semester, we will have our annual Wolf Lecture, uh, named after my revered predecessor, Alan Wolf. The Wolf Lecture on Religion and American Politics featuring Kay Schultzman and David Hopkins in a lecture entitled, Parties in the Pews in a Divided Nation about the upcoming election, about the elections that have just passed as well as the elections next year. And we will be hosting our annual Prophetic Voices lecture uh, in April, I think we decided, is that right, in April? Okay, all right, um, featuring Massimo Fagioli, who teaches theology at Villanova. So there's a lot, a lot of exciting things on the horizon. I ask you to check us out. You are most welcome uh, to attend any and all of those. It gives me great. Yeah, the mic's not working. Can't hear me? Now. In fact, maybe we can all just do a sound check. Sound check, sound check, yeah. one, two. Um, I hate these things, okay. Sound check, uh, sound it's check. a great pleasure to introduce uh, our two panelists today. Susanna Heschel is the Eli M. Black Distinguished Professor and Chair of Jewish Studies at Dartmouth College, researching the history of Jewish and Protestant religious thought in Germany during the 19th and 20th centuries. She is the author of more than 100 articles I always have to lay down when I say that. Let me say that again. She is the author of over 100 articles and numerous books, including Abraham Geiger and the, Jew and the Jewish Jesus and the Aryan G Jesus, Christian Theologians and the Bible in Nazi Germany. She is the editor as well of two volumes of her father's writings, including Moral Grandeur and Spiritual Audacity, Writings of Abraham Joshua Heschel. Alicia Wiesel is a self-proclaimed recovering Wall Street executive, retiring from 25 years at Goldman Sachs. Since his father's passing, he's taken up his father's message, speaking at, among other places, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum on the need to protect the LGBTQ community, Auschwitz on the plight of Syrian refugees, and in the Financial Times on the urgency of upholding DACA. Currently, Alicia advises several startups in the FinTech space and chairs the Eli Wiesel Foundation. And as always, she, he says, he learns a little Talmud every day. Please join me in, in welcoming our two distinguished guests. But I thought we'd do, we'd have about 45 minutes of Q&A that I'll be asking them and then we'll stop and you can ask them your questions. We will we'll have two people holding the microphones that, that you can use. Just put up your hand and let us know you wanna have a question. Um, I guess I wanna start by asking both of you to talk about the friendship that developed between your two fathers uh, when they were with us and when you were children, and do you, do you have any personal memories of that friendship between your parents? You want me to go first, or yeah? Look, I'll start. How's my sound, first of all? Do I have to hold it up here for it to work? I kind of do. I'll do that. Um, 
You know, I grew up, first of all, first of all, let me just say thank you, Mark, for inviting us, and thank you, Susanna, for letting me be part of this. Originally, this was a 100% uh, Susanna show, and I feel very, very lucky to get to, uh, to, get to be part of this. Um, it's a great gift to me. Uh, I grew up hearing stories of how um, there was one friend of my father's who outdid himself in always sending the most beautiful orchids to my mother when they got married at Chag. You know, my mother would just grow up talking about it because there was a deep and beautiful friendship between my father and Susanna's father. And the beauty of it is that, um, you know, Rabbi Heschel also recognized my mother. And what a smart move. Because I'll tell you, to be a friend of my dad's, you better also be a friend of my mom's. Or you were going to find that you were not getting as much time to see him. The door would be mysteriously closed. He wouldn't be there when he was supposed to be there. So it was a very smart, practical move, but also one that showed how deeply close he was to both my parents. So I grew up hearing those stories. So actually, before Alicia was born, uh, I was a child and I remember his father coming to our home on Shabbat afternoon. Shabbat afternoon, so it would be when, of course, to the synagogue, Shabbat morning, and then we would come home, we would have lunch, and my parents would take a nap, which was a terrible time for me because I had to be quiet. And, uh, and then they would wake up and Alicia's father would come over. He was not yet married, he was single and living also, as we did, on Riverside Drive. And he and my father would go for a walk across the street in Riverside Park and then come back to our apartment and have tea, Shabbat afternoon tea. Uh, and then depending on the time of year, it's usually though the, the fall winter months, so Shabbat ended fairly early. Um, but I also remember we lived in an apartment building, uh, the same apartment building, as one of my father's colleagues at the Jewish Theological Seminary where he taught. That was Professor Saul Lieberman. And uh, we were on the eighth floor, he was on the fifth floor, and Alicia's father would come, was friendly with both, and would come to have the elevator stop on one floor or the other. I do remember one time that um, I, my parents, it was right after Shabbat, one winter, my parents were ready to visit my uncle, who was the Kapitulitzer Rebbe, a Hasidic Rebbe on the Lower East Side of New York, and I was maybe 10. And for whatever reason, 10, 11, I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay home. And I complained. I was not in a good mood, in other words. And my parents didn't have a babysitter. As we went down in the elevator, the elevator came to the ground floor and opened. And there was Alicia's father who was arriving to visit Professor and Mrs. Lieberman. And he saw that I was upset. And he was so kind. And he tried to comfort me, cheer me up. And he, he said, I'm going to Paris this week, and I'll bring you a present. What would you like? And of course, that made me happy. And I actually remember what I asked him to bring me. What was it? <laughs> I, had it <laughs> I had an aunt who always wore a perfume called Bologna. And it had a marvelous scent that I loved growing up. And I asked him for it. For Bologna perfume, like, and he brought it to me for Paris, which is amazing. Because how often does an adult remember what a ten-year-old asks for, really? You know? But he was so attentive and so kind, and of course, it made me extremely happy and, and grateful. So I think he also loved children. Also, he was, you know, bribery was definitely a tool in his toolkit. Um, you know, there was no question when it came to like making, you know, kids happy or like shalom bayit was like those were. Two very important words to him. And if bribery was involved, bribery would, would, would wow. carry the day. Do you, do you remember them singing Zemiros together? Yes, yes. I also, um, I also remember when, when your father became engaged to your mother in Paris, and uh, my parents made a, a shalashudas, a Shabbat afternoon, more than a, a tea, a high tea, a, a very nice. And um, in their honor, and they came, and there were some other people. Um, there's a tradition that's mentioned, uh, that it's rabbinic, but uh, more Hasidic than anything else, but sort of lost these days, which is when, um, when a groom gets married, when a man gets married, he uh, carries some hadas, some branches of, just say hadas, myrtle, myrtle is the word. 
myrtle leaves, branches. Uh, that's associated with Which symbolizes right? fidelity, right? <laughs> yes. And so when my father bought some myrtle branches and put them on the table, and it was a very unusual for, for my childhood, a very beautiful occasion. So I think that their friendship, especially in the beginning, uh, so before your father was married and um, he was living in a small apartment in Riverside Drive and working as a journalist. Uh, and I don't know, I had this, he was always a very, very, to me as a child, serious, thoughtful, intense person. And I think that their friendship was, I'm sure, also very intense. I like how you describe serious and thoughtful. I want to read you something which is, how my father describes your father, um, which is kind of interesting. So uh, it's talking about, similarly, you know, Susanna was talking about this, um, my, my parents being engaged and uh, a wedding being on the way. So my father's telling the story um, of an ufruf being given to a young man who has been, you know, pulled into a shtibol and he doesn't really want the ufruf. He doesn't want this customary celebration that the bridegroom gro goes through before he's getting married. So my father says, um, from the privacy of my corner, I observe the young man, referring to the bridegroom. He is moved, but his emotions are under control. I notice the famous thinker, A.J. Heschel. He too is watching the bridegroom. So famous thinker, why so melancholy, I ask him. I look at this man and I see him elsewhere, if not for the war. It goes on, but here is my father observing your father being melancholy, you know, and reflecting on that in the context of this bridegroom who later in the story we discover has lost all of his relatives to the Holocaust and is without someone to celebrate the Ofruf with. Yes, I think those last words, melancholy, yeah. he went somewhere else the time before the war. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I imagine for both of our fathers, they were living in two time frames, the now and the before the war. Can you I'm sorry. Us? They were living in two time frames, the now and the before the war. Is this? It's now it's on. I said they were living in two time frames, the now, the here and now, and the before the war. I want to ask you, this is a question that Hollywood children get all the time. How old were you when you realized that your fathers were famous and important, and how did you accept that, or did you accept that, or I mean, first? I, I think, um, I, I remember once my parents saying to me, well, did you, you know, how do you feel about your father being in the newspaper? Both of them were saying, and I said, well, a lot of people are in the newspaper every day. What is it? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but I do know when I was very little, I tried to understand, what does my father do? Children, you know that my father is a, a doctor, a lawyer. So I couldn't understand, what does he do? He teaches, he writes books, what, what is it he does? And I do remember when I was quite little, figuring it out. I must have been three or four, or something like that. And I said, Moshe wrote the Torah, and Tata, my father, writes books. Wow. And that was... Both, both of which are true <laughs> statements. Both of which are true statements, I believe. <laughs> I elevated him, certainly. I love that. Um, <laughs> you know, I similarly remember, and how's my sound? Is my sound okay? Uh, I similarly remember, I think, you know, they say uh, girls mature faster. So if Susanna realized all this at three and four, I might have been eight or nine before I started getting an inkling. Um, it can take boys a little longer, at least this one. I remember my friends were saying, you know, oh, my dad's a pharmacist. He saves people's lives. Uh, well, my dad was an Air Force pilot in the Israeli Air Force, and now he flies El Al jumbo jets. And I'd say, I think something really bad happened to my dad, and that's kind of all I understood. And that's where I stayed for a while. I couldn't quite figure out that he was a teacher, that he was a writer. That took me a little while, probably not till I was like 10 or 11 that I finally start understanding. So, Alicia, how did your father explain his experience in Germany and in the Holocaust to you? when he did sit you down and explain this. Right, remember he wasn't in Germany, he was in Romania. Um, he, uh, you know, my father once sat me down, I remember I asked, where are my grandparents? And he said, sadly, your, your grandparents and much of our family were destroyed in a terrible tragedy. But believe it or not, that's all he actually ever said on the subject to me. 
at a young age. The rest was really absorbed by osmosis. My friends were going to Palm Beach or to the Hamptons for their vacations, and I was going on presidential commissions to visit Auschwitz and Treblinka. Um, <laughs> so you start to pick up a little bit, you know, just through osmosis that something else, there's ambient learning, something else happened here. And, and what were the first books that you read by your fathers? Do you remember? Um, I'm pretty sure the first book I read was either The Trial of God or Zalman, The Madness of God. And I think it was The Trial of God because it was sort of a short, digestible play. Um, you know, I think I read that before I read Night. Okay. Susanna, do you remember? Yes, I, I, I remember because Alicia's father gave my parents copies of, uh, of Night, Dawn, and The Accident, and I was, I was pretty young, and, uh, and I read all three. And then I also wanted my friends, when I was a teenager and also in college, if there was someone who wanted to be my friend or whom I wanted as a friend, I would sit them down and hand them Night and tell them, you must read this right now. That was a kind of prerequisite to being my friend. They had to do this. That is a high prerequisite, I might add. Um, and that was a very, it was very important to me that I couldn't really be friends with someone unless they understood and had read this book. So did you, how old were you when your father explained to Susanna the Holocaust? I think it was similar, uh, but I, I was quite young. And um, osmosis and also when I would walk in New York City, walk with my father, and he would tell me about things that happened uh, and about relatives. I, um, I can remember the first time I read something by Susanna's father, and I'll confess it was much later in life. It was really in the year or two after my father had passed, and I had returned to some semblance of Jewish observance. And I was trying to understand, you know, what is the Sabbath, what is Shabbat really about? And a friend said, well, then you have to read what Rabbi Heschel writes about Shabbat. And then I read that book. I think I devoured it, you know, in just record time, um, hanging on every word, amazed at this concept of how I had gone through my life, able to appreciate, you know, a beautiful statue such as the one out in that lobby and every little bit of attention to detail, how it's carved, how the joinery fits. And then here comes Rabbi Heschel that says, that what the Jewish people have built and what God has built is, you know, palaces in time. Maybe I'm not getting the, the exact expression right, but this concept of an architecture that is the crafting of time, how the minutes fold into each other, how observance is structured. Um, and it was, it was a changing book for me to read. Really cool. And I have to just say that I, I just came back yesterday from a week in Eastern Poland uh, where there, there, is no, there are no Jews within an hour and a half radius, let's say, of Lublin, which is where I was based. And uh, among all the, the horrors and the devastation that I, I knew about, being there also makes a difference. And I was also just struck that Poland is without Shabbat. Mm -hmm. To be in a place where there is no Shabbat, where no one observes Shabbat. Krakow. Yes, of course, Krakow, well, I mean really the eastern yeah. part of Krakow, Warsaw, have communities, so there's a bit in, in Łódź, but uh, that was sh shocking to me. And how terrible to try to create a world without Shabbat. Yeah. What do you take to be the most important legacies of your fathers, both within the American Jewish community and within American culture generally? Want me to go first? Sure. Look, I think um, I have views as well on, on the legacy of Susanna's father, and I'm curious to hear her views on my dad. So I hope there's also some interchange, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll go first and talk about my father's legacy. I think that my father is primarily remembered in this country as a universalist, someone who stood up against injustice, who was not afraid to use his voice, who had no problem telling a sitting president of the United States that what they were doing was wrong, um, and someone who intervened, whether it was speaking up for, um, for the casualties occurring in Bosnia 
or Rwanda. He took it upon himself as a universalist to make sure that the world was a better place. I fear a little bit that there's a danger that my father's legacy is, and I'll be very careful with the word, de-Judaized. I'm not saying that people try to you know, consciously ignore the fact that he was an observant Jew, but I will say that the thought of my father being this universalist, but also being somebody deeply, deeply rooted in where he came from, deeply rooted in Jewish observance, deeply committed to Jewish continuity and Jewish education, a deep and proud Zionist who was, you know, always thinking about what do we do for our six or seven million um, Jewish brothers and sisters in Israel and how do we stand by them even when the world is quick to criticize them. These are aspects of my father's legacy that I will just say they're somewhat maybe less popular in the American imagination. Um, and some of that has to do with politi politicization of certain topics. Some of that just has to do with my father reached a stature where everybody said, we all have a stake in him because of what he says and who he is. And in that process, he's lost a little bit of that um, particularist legacy, which is something I pay specific attention to. I would just want to add to that, that I think, I think your father also had a wonderful way of articulating, of speaking what he said. That is, is his message and also his manner of speaking. And when he said to Reagan, before Reagan was going to go to Bitburg, uh, which I imagine most of you remember, the a cemetery in Germany where there were SS officers buried, and, and your father went and said, the way he spoke to him, this is not your place, Mr. President. That to me also was a, a Jewish way of speaking. Mm -hmm. He had a Jewish way of presenting what he said. And that I appreciate very much. He didn't go in and, and, and get angry or, or berate. Or the way he said it, and that was in his manner, he also preserved something very important to me about Jewish culture, about what it is to be a Jew. This is how a Jew speaks to a president. I, I love what you're saying. The, the way that I think about this, Susanna, is I always think that there's um, we have this concept in Judaism of there is a Torah that is written, and there is also an oral tradition, and the two sort of go together. There's Torah Shabichtav, and then there's Torah Shabichtav. And the Torah Shabichtav, like the things that my father actually said and wrote, are there for the reading. They're in the books, they're in the transcripts of his speeches, they're in the videos, but it's really this oral tradition. It's, it's, if you knew him, it was the way in which he did these things that in some sense was the, the secret sauce that you can only, only get a sense of how he met him. Yes, and the inspiration that he brought to people. People were moved and inspired. And, and the, what he spoke about also, when he spoke about Hasidic figures, about the Bible, about the Talmud, such a range uh, that I think a lot of Jews didn't know about. But I think how much he brought Jews closer to Jewish sources, to Jewish texts, is very important. He was a consummate teacher and, and an inspiring teacher. Uh, and I think that was an extremely important part of his legacy. And the fact that he was able to speak to so many different kinds of people uh, and present himself in this way, in a very Jewish way, was extremely important, so valuable. And, and what, what do you think about your father's <laughs> legacy? Uh, so in many ways, my father is similar. Both of our fathers are from Eastern Europe, from religious backgrounds, to people imbued with strong rabbinic knowledge and also with a Hasidic sensibility, a sensibility of what it is to be a pious Jew from Eastern Europe. Both named after their grandfathers. Yes, yes. I was actually an opt on Sunday. Um, and, and so, I, I, you know, and that's also part of what's so important because they, they preserved the world that was destroyed. And, uh, and that's, that's quite extraordinary. But your dad's legacy is huge, right? I mean, you think about the signal that it sent, that here is an ordained rabbi with a yarmulke 
holding a Torah, like showing up at some of these like critically important civil rights marches. And I know that there's way more to your dad, but like he has, I think, become a symbol in a real way of like the thought that political activism is an important expression of Jewish values. That that's he's the canonical, I think, symbol of that now. Yes, in that sense, both of our fathers. I have to, by the way, I should just say, my father marched with Dr. King in Selma and spoke with him on multiple occasions, addressing rabbis and various groups, and uh, and was very strongly committed. And was very, my father was close to many other of the civil rights leaders, and I'm I'm happy about that. I'm happy also because the civil rights leaders, you know, went through very profound training in what is called nonviolence. Nonviolence doesn't mean you hit. You don't hit back when someone hits you, something like that, that's superficial. It was about transforming the self, how to be a, a different kind of human being. And it took months of thinking and talking, of cultivating the heart, the mind, the sensibilities, how to think differently. And those civil rights leaders to this day are so grateful when I meet them. They're grateful to my father 60 years later. And that's such an important lesson to be grateful for something that happened 60 years ago. And I think we should all be grateful, grateful because our fathers devoted themselves to their work. Our fathers worked hard and were very intensely productive people who cared deeply about this world and how to make it better. Uh, and yeah, so, but I'll just say that there's, there's a photograph uh, of my father with Dr. King and also Rabbi Maurice Eisendroth. It's at, not at Selma. There was no safer Torah. There was no Torah scroll at Selma. That was a demonstration in Arlington, Virginia against the war in Vietnam. Hmm. And Rabbi Eisendroth, who was head of the reform movement, brought a safer Torah. He really shouldn't have. My father didn't. He wouldn't do that because you can't just carry a Torah outside like that. It has to be protected. But it wasn't Unless Selma. Unless it's Torah. <laughs> Unless it's Simcha's Torah. So um, I, I, it's, it, there's so much confusion. And I guess I wonder if you have this experience too, that sometimes people say things about our fathers and you want to say, no, that actually didn't happen. Ah, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Well, it's not a question of just it didn't happen, but how about um, you know, the using of sound bites to kind of over condense down who they were? <laughs> For example, I'd love to hear your response to this. One might think that the only way that Rabbi Heschel thought it was appropriate to pray was with one's feet. I'm marching, I'm <laughs> praying with my feet. Maybe that's the only way to pray. Yeah, and he, because he said, after Selma, I felt my legs were praying. It's also, he would, yeah. But that became a thing. It became a thing. I think there's a whole generation of kids that like, figured out that they could try to cut, you know, their morning tefillah, their morning prayers at Jewish schools. Oh, I was out walking. I was praying with my feet, right? You know, uh. It's arguable. I could make a strong case that your two fathers are the two American Jewish intellectuals that most Christians read. I think it's very hard to get to Boston College without having read one or both of your parents. Uh, we have a big theology program, and all of our undergraduates take it, some of them kicking and screaming, some of them delighted. Uh, <laughs> but, but they read both your parents. What do you think is the legacy of your fathers to the American Christian community? There's, civil rights is an obvious one. What else? This is the curveball. I didn't I tell them I was going to ask. No, I have, I have thoughts. Do you want, you want to go, go first? Go ahead. You know, it's interesting. My father formed some deep friendships with Christian leaders, uh, Cardinal O'Connor, and they actually published a, you know, a book together on some of their dialogues. My father actually, you know, it's interesting. First of all, in general, Jews don't proselytize. Um, there's a bit of an exception. People attack Chabad and say Chabad is proselytizing, but Chabad is never trying to get a non-Jew to do a Jewish mitzvah. They just want Jews to do the Jewish mitzvahs. But in general, you know, Jews don't proselytize. But my father had a strong view that he wanted his Christian friend to be a better Christian. He wanted his Muslim friend to be a better Muslim. He had a feeling that wherever you were, if you were grounded in faith, and by the way, if you're an atheist, well then be a better atheist, no matter how you choose to declare your theological views and convictions, 
you always have an opportunity to be a better incarnation of that point of view. And my father was very deeply committed to that. Um, and always, the other thing I would just say is that in all of these discussions, my father had questions and loved to engage, and he was a very curious person. So anytime that I heard him in some of these interfaith exchanges, it was always from a position of compassion, genuine education. Um, I would say that my father did remind, where appropriate, the Christian faith-based community of where they had gone wrong. And the fact that you know, Pius XII had not done enough during the Holocaust and that there was proof that he hadn't done enough. And you know, he wanted to make sure that these things were on account because he believed in the truth and that only by looking at the actual historical record does anyone have an opportunity to do better. So those are some thoughts. So uh, I, I noticed that when my father wrote his doctoral dissertation, which was in Berlin, uh, he finished it in um, December of 1932. It was a study of the Hebrew prophets. And the dissertation is also a very strong critique of Protestant biblical scholarship. Very strong, very sharp. Uh, I think he's right, by the way. <laughs> But the Protestant Bible scholars were often saying that the Hebrew prophets were falling down on the ground in fits and losing consciousness, and they were ecstatics, romantics, and writhing on the ground, didn't know what they were doing. It's very negative. Uh, and so it's understandable my father would be critical of it, because at the end, what do you have? Nothing. Um, to say nothing of Aaron Strolch, who said in, uh, that the, this is in a, in a lecture, December 1915, that the prophets were basically country bumpkins. They came from rural villages, and then they went to a city and preached. But what do they know? They're preaching against, against war, against a military? How silly. Everybody needs a military, et cetera, et cetera. So that was, I think, the last time that my father was directly critical of anything associated with Christianity, because like Alicia's father, he, he also looked for what we have in common, <clears throat> what we share, but also most important, how we can help one another. How we can help one another when we face moments of despair, when it's hard to pray. How do we sustain one another? And he pointed out, my father pointed out that in Areas and moments when, when Christians are pious, Jews are also pious. We affect one another. He called his first major speech about this, no religion is an island. We're not isolated from each other. And then when my father wrote about piety, about holiness, about God in search of man, about prayer, what he writes is meaningful to all of us. It's not, it's not limited to Jews, it's, it's human, human experience. How can we cultivate in ourselves the ability to perceive God's presence? Do we stop for a moment and have an experience of awe and wonder? Too often, I think, especially after the war, it would be easy to withdraw to feel despair. Uh, Nachman of Bratislav makes a distinction between the, the absence of God's presence that we sometimes feel. I don't feel God's presence. That's one thing, but the other is the presence of God's absence, which is something more difficult. How do we overcome that? And so I think my father's legacy would be a gift to all of us who are striving as religious people, simply as human beings. What is my obligation, he said? What is the obligation of this generation? Never to be indifferent to other people's suffering. Would your father? Can I, can I just expand on that? And I think that uh, th this word indifference, I want to underline, because I think that my father is also often quoted. He has a quote that says, the opposite of love is not hate it's indifference, we must never be silent. And this concept of not being indifferent to the suffering of others, yes, I think it's true that that's a major part of my father's legacy, and we're very united in that. And I think that both our fathers, though, went 
further with that, which is not only should you be indifferent to the suffering of others, you shouldn't be indifferent to joy. You shouldn't be indifferent to life. You shouldn't be indifferent to tradition. You think about all the different, you know, I certainly remember growing up as a teenager, I felt massively indifferent to this tradition that I felt was crushing me. I had to do all these obligations. I was going to a yeshiva. I felt indifferent to a lot of different things. <laughs> it wasn't just a question of indifferent to other people's sufferings. And I think that in many ways my dad stood for, and, and so did your dad, this, this fighting against indifference to the whole thing. You have to be engaged with life. Um, you have to be engaged with life, its ups and downs, and, and be connected to where you came from, and don't try to pretend you're not. Um, but it's a much broader fight against indifference than I think just against the indifference of the suffering of others. Yes. Would your fathers have agreed on, the, on Zionism and how one does support the state of Israel? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And I have to say, after just being in, in Poland and seeing these towns that used to be 60%, 70 80 90% Jewish, empty, what's left? A cemetery, Jewish cemetery, doesn't even have the graves, the stones. A cemetery where they murder Jews in the cemetery. I was in, a, in this town, Opt, where the it was still, you can see in some of them, Jewish homes. What do you expect after that? Of course, there has to be some kind of Jewish sovereignty, without question, a state, without question. And that's not, I mean, I, I, that's not the only reason. Uh, but yes, well, it, it felt quite visceral to me this past week. You also have to remember, I think, you know, well, your father passed, I think, before the whole Zionism is racism movement began in 75, really sponsored by, you know, the Soviets um, as a way to sort of punish, um, you know, the U.S. and Israel interests that had built in the Middle East. So your, your father at least didn't get to see this whole, you know, accusation pointed that Zionism is racism, all of these things that have become the underpinnings of much of the foundational attack against the Jewish state, you know, in modern day. Um, thank God he didn't have to see that. Mm -hmm. Both your fathers were very concerned about the rights of minorities, religious minorities and other minorities in the United States. Do you think that they drew on specifically Jewish tradition and sources for that call? Or was it because they were more generically religious and recognized because the Jews themselves had been persecuted that they have How many times does it say in the Torah, you know, you must treat the stranger in your midst you know, in a certain way, you must give him rights, you must treat him well. I think it's, it may be the yeah. single most, most underlined frequent. mitzvah in the entire Torah. And remember that you were once slaves in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Yes, the most frequently repeated. Great, thank you. I think I want to open this up to your questions. Do you have any questions? There's, there's a gentleman over here, Suze. Yeah, hi. Did it work? Does it work? It doesn't appear, it doesn't appear to be on. Hello? Can you hear me? No. Testing? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, hi, I'm Jack and the Sun Porter. I, I knew both your fathers, and uh, your father I knew quite well at um, Boston University under Silber. And I have a question about something that happened there that's somewhat controversial. And I also knew your father at a ADL conference in 1970. And what was interesting was that when I met you and your mother, and we were sitting in an alcove, I think it was- Can you speak louder? Just project. Just speak I, I, in a loud voice. Okay. In the microphone. Yeah, can you hear this? That's yeah, better. better. Okay. Uh, he was about to give a talk. We were meeting in the alcove. And there were very few Jewish leaders. The people in the Halkov were mostly priests and nuns and a few ministers. And that's, you know, I remember that as a young person that he, uh, that was the people that, uh, and his opening remarks was, I got this award and it was the first time you gave it to a Hebrew teacher. I remember that very well at the ADL. But the question I have for Alicia is somewhat controversial. 
I, w I was in, at Boston University when your father received the Nobel Prize, and there were two pushbacks then. One was the head of Penn, uh, a writer here in Cambridge. Uh, she, I asked her to, for your father to speak. She rejected that. She said he wanted for peace. He's not really a writer. So that was one pushback that we received uh, back then. And the second was I always felt that Simon Wiesenthal should have gotten the award together with your father. And it was very sad that he had that relationship with the head of the UN who turned out to be a Nazi. And I think that was the reason why Simon Wiesenthal didn't get the award. I just know what your views were about uh, your father winning the Nobel Prize and some of, the, and also the, the help of, of course, John Silber, naturally. Uh, uh, I'll try to respond as best I can. First of all, my father was very close friends with John Silber. Um, they were, they really, for very different people with remarkably different political views and backgrounds, they really connected and there was a tremendous amount of respect between those two people, yeah. uh, between those two men. Um, I can't comment on Simon Wiesenthal's Nobel candidacy. I honestly have nothing of, I have no knowledge to share with you. Uh, on the thought that my father was rejected for a certain lecture because he didn't win the Nobel for literature, but instead won it for peace. I think my dad originally really wanted it for literature. Um, I think at one point he, he was hoping he'd be more recognized as a writer, but I think my father was, this was not, my father was not measuring himself by these things. So I, I don't think it had that deep of an impact. Okay. Well, we were delighted that Alicia's father came as our commencement speaker at Dartmouth uh, and uh, some years ago. It was a wonderful occasion and we were thrilled. And the students were absolutely in heaven and overjoyed and honored. All of us were faculty and students uh, because we held him in enormous esteem. And I think that's true of all generations, of all ages. Uh, and so, you know, if, if some if, if some Nudnik doesn't agree, okay. But we certainly appreciated him and his legacy is going to last for generations to come as well. He was an inspiring commencement speaker to all of us and I think it was the most significant of the 25 years I've taught at Dartmouth and it was really thrilling and we're grateful because traveling up to Dartmouth is not so easy. I have a feeling, <laughs> I have a feeling I I have a feeling I know why he went. Right here. Testing. We're also willing to repeat the question if that helps. Yeah. Can you hear me? First of all, I'd like, I'd like to thank the guest speakers. I'd like to go back to a point that uh, Professor Heschel mentioned about storytelling. In particular, Boston has a special connection, Alicia, with your father because he was a professor at BU, where I also teach. And there was a kind of annual pilgrimage to hear your father give the three free talks. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, he went home at least at the end of two of them to see you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know how you relate to his Boston connection. I also sat in on uh, one of your father's classes, and one thing that impressed me, in addition to his storytelling, was his ability to listen to his students. He gave, for example, the undergraduate students the utmost attention and respect. So maybe, and also, at BU, there are common connections with Dr. Martin Luther King uh, and also uh, your father, Alicia. So maybe could you talk a little about the Boston connection? Yeah, I'll, I'll comment on it through a story. Um, I can really only think of two times in my father's entire life that he was actually angry with me. My father was such a gentle soul. What would it take for him to really get angry with his son? And by the way, like I did a lot. I had a purple mohawk in college. I was like <laughs> not going to classes that often. Like I, I had a lot of problems. So like, what does it really take to get a man like that 
angry at me. Um, so the first one, I'll go in reverse order. So during college, I had some friends home, and it was at the time that I think the um, Bush Senior Supreme Court was uh, contemplating an amendment making it illegal to burn the flag. And we were having a, you know, a dinner table conversation about it with me and some friends, and I was, I was going off and I was espousing my you know, freshman college year you know, liberal views, saying you know, the right to burn the flag is even more beautiful you know, than the flag itself, you know, like, of course, this should not be a thing. And my father went dead silent and, like, conversation stopped. And he said, with, like, barely controlled anger, he said, if you had been there at Buchenwald when that flag arrived with the men carrying it who had lost brothers fighting for our freedom, you would never say anything so silly again at my table. So that was one. To connect it back to Boston, um, when I was, I think, five or six, I remember my dad had to go up for his weekly commute to Boston. And for whatever reason, I really wanted his attention then and there. And I was firmly attached to his leg. And I was screaming and crying, Daddy, Daddy, don't leave me, don't leave me. And he got angry. And he pulled me off. And he said, I have students. It's where I need to go. This is important to me. This is a major part of who I am. I don't remember exactly what he said, but that was what he conveyed. And he put me down and he walked out the door. He said, I have to go. So these are two instances where you see some of the bedrock of what my father was really committed to as an American and as a teacher to his students here in Boston. Thank you guys so much for uh, speaking. It's wonderful to get to learn a little from you guys today. Um, my question is for Alicia. I think I, like many uh, young American Jews, ended up reading night in 10th grade English class in a public school in a predominantly Jewish area, but not one that our class was maybe one third Jewish, a quarter Jewish. Um, and it hurt. Uh, to read night in a, you know, in a universalized setting. I, I, I don't know how else to put it, but this is an experience I've shared with others who, you know, the Holocaust gets mentioned at the end of teaching World War II history. Oh, by the way, this happened. Moving on. Or this is a nice poetic demonstration of dehumanization. What an interesting literary device. Um, I, I wonder how uh, your father would have wanted the book to be taught um, to, to a mixed setting in particular, not to a Jewish setting, to a public yeah. school in the middle of America. So the question is how my father would have felt about night being taught so broadly with all of the things that I think come with it, which is literary analysis of technique and all these other pieces being taught as sort of as a book. I mean, the question I would ask you in return is, what's the alternative for it to not be taught? Um, so I think it's much better than the alternative. I think you know it's interesting. My father, we, we were approached, parenthesis, we were approached by many filmmakers, especially after my father's passing, who wanted to make a movie out of night. And my father, in one of like the real clear instructions he left, he said, I never want there to be anything between my words and my reader. And so he said, okay, no dramatizations of night, no films. But I would tell you that the experience, it's not a long book, and the experience of reading it, you kind of don't need a teacher in between you. And I get countless letters from students who whatever literary analysis conversation is going on or a mapping back to world and current events, the ability of a student, whether they are Jewish or not Jewish, to read that book in, the sit in a sitting of two to three hours and just devour it and complete it and be changed by it, I think, you know, I can't imagine a teacher so bad that could screw that up because they're not in between the words and the reader, right? The reader has the ability to read that book and you know, the teacher can go, womp, 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 you know, like Charlie Brown style. Um, I, think a, I think a reader who gets, the, who gets hooked is not going to be um, deterred from their mission of reading it. That's my thought. 
any other questions? Questions? Uh, mm -hmm. Right here. Hi, um, Ruth Gold. Um, are both of you only children? Yes. <laughs> and of, of our fathers. My mother had a previous daughter. Um, did, uh, was it, did it feel burdensome at all? Did you have feelings about being an only child when you were growing up? Um, I'm just sort of curious about that. Uh, I had uh, always wished that I might have a much older big brother uh, who would defend me uh, to my parents when I wanted things like um, I wanted to be allowed to wear loafers, loafers, shoes, and not always shoes with shoelaces, which was the rule, uh, and things like that. Uh, I, uh, I thought if I had an older brother, he would, he would defend me to my parents and he would succeed and I would get permission for that. Those were my wishes, but beyond that, um, I, I, loved, uh, I loved my parents. I, 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 yeah, it was a bit medieval. That's all. I always tell people. I grew up in the Middle Ages. Uh, in, in what regard? What is I miss. That? I, I <laughs> uh, when I got really, really mad, I would think, "I'm going to wear pants to the synagogue," <laughs> right, right, right. which, of course, I would never do. It was forbidden to wear pants. Period. I didn't own pants. It just one didn't wear you know, skirts always. Uh, but that was my thought, my fantasy. That was the worst thing I could come up with. And that's pretty, <laughs> pretty pathetic, actually. That was, yeah. I would have been a bad influence on you if we'd hung out together. <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> but, yeah. There's a gen the gentleman right over here. Um, under the thought that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, I, can I ask you to think of what your parents might have said and suggested looking at the level of anti-Semitism on college campuses, I'm not talking about entertainers with their stupidity, but what's going on in college campuses or on the streets of Brooklyn or that, how, how ought, what would they teach us to, to react to and do? I think you should repeat it. I didn't quite. I heard you repeat the it. question is, what would, our, what would our fathers have thought about the state of anti-Semitism on college campuses? <sighs> You live it every day, so you're much closer than I am. Um, I, 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 I cannot imagine my father uh, actually having to endure witnessing rising anti-Semitism. It's not just college campuses. Um, I think the horror of that for him would have been overwhelming. I think it would have given him a heart attack. Uh, I, I can't imagine it, and I, I um, uh, and I'm horrified because I feel we're we're getting it from all directions, right wing, left wing, uh, people who are intelligent and educated, and people who are not, and uh, and nobody knows what to do about it other than condemn it, uh, and that's it's very frightening, and the condemnation is then used as so-called proof, you see? Someone who said, all oh, the Jews control whatever, Hollywood, the media, banks, whatever, and then Jews that you can't say this and we're cutting you off from uh, this or that. And then they say, you see? See how the Jews control everything and now I've lost my whatever. It's the, the problem, it's, it's like Karl Popper's understanding of falsifiability, that a scientific experiment is only legitimate if it can be falsified. If it can't be falsified, it's not really science. It becomes circular argument. And anti-Semitism functions in that way when it gets really bad, and it is really bad right now. It's not falsifiable. Whatever you do to counter it just becomes more um, grist for the mill, so to speak. Uh, and, uh, and so what we're doing, we're condemning, condemning, because essentially we, we don't know what to do in many ways to make it stop. Uh, that's the problem. And that's also horrifying, because as a historian, I've read about efforts that were made in Germany in the 19th century, for example, 
when there was also a sudden rise of anti-Semitism in the late 1870s and 80s and 90s, nothing worked. Uh, and that's frightening. What does it take then for this to end? What do we do? Uh, nobody seems to know. And I guess I'm also worried that we come at it from different directions. <clears throat> There's some who say blame the left, some blame the right, but it's, it's everyone. They're, they're mirroring each other. And one feeds the other. So what do we do? What should we do? And they're logically contradictory. The arguments that you hear, right? right? The right wing hates Jews because we are the puppet masters. We have facilitated the, um, the, the social climb of people of color. Uh, we, have, we have degraded the white man by helping our communities of color. And on the other hand, then you have hatred that comes from the left, Louis Farrakhan, which says, no, you are the white man, you are colonialist, you are this and that and the other thing, and these, these logically contradictory you know, statements. But you know, my father saw a lot of this in his lifetime, you know, and actually I've been able to find, he actually wrote specific messages you know, to these groups, to the, to the person who hates from the right, to the person who hates from the left. So it, it, it's something he had to deal with, you know, like I said, all the way back to the 60s and 70s. Alicia, a couple years ago, um, Boisey had an event called Is There a New Anti-Semitism? Susanna was part of this event. Uh, would you, I remember your famous answer to this question. You said, it's not new, it's just now, it now has guns, is what you said. Is that what? It, it now has guns. It now has guns, uh, yeah. Do you want to revisit that question? Or would you still agree with what you had said three years ago? That there's really not a new form of anti-Semitism. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, what the danger is when it spreads, when it becomes widespread, when it reaches so many different levels, that is the intellectuals and, and the uneducated, the, the wealthy and the poor, and yeah, uh, that I find horrifying. And it was, I think, not anticipated. Uh, it was my sense, I didn't think there would be anything like this in the United States of America or around the world, and it is worldwide. So it's horrifying, it's shocking, and I, I do worry very much for uh, what's coming in the future, uh, because it's been such a rapid ascent, and if it keeps going at this rate, uh, I'm very afraid. Alicia, do you want to comment? I do, and I know we're near our, our end of our time, right? So. Um, I'll make one more observation, again, not on what my father necessarily said, but more on what he did and his manner, which was such an excellent point that you brought up earlier. A lot of this targeting of the Jews, I think, is correlated to the degree of politicization and our political divide in this country and across the world more broadly. Nationalists and socialists, um, it's just gotten deeper and deeper and deeper. And my father is often quoted on this phrase that silence always benefits the tormentor, therefore we must never be silent. But it's a little misleading because my father was a master of silence. He knew that sometimes like if everybody's yelling at each other, okay, you know what, we've moved past indifference into outright screaming at each other. And that's not what he meant. That's not what he meant by indifference is the enemy. He didn't mean for us to be screaming at each other. He wanted us listening to each other. And in order to listen to someone, even if you think you're gonna disagree with what they're about to say, involves a healthy measure of silence. So I actually feel that even though my father is quoted as having taken this stance against silence, the most Elie Wiesel-like thing that many of us can do in our day-to-day -day engagements is actually champion silence a little bit more. Mm. Right. Another question, Anne, right here. Um, apropos of this, uh, what influence or what effect do you think it has, and especially on younger people, college students, <clears throat> 
that the Holocaust is receding in history as it becomes farther away in terms of years and is less uh, a visceral memory. Is that something that concerns you? And do you think that feeds into some of the rise of anti-Semitism? Would you repeat the question? Please? Yes, so as the Holocaust recedes in time, yeah. uh, does that contribute uh, to the rising anti-Semitism? You know, I don't know. It's a very, um, it's something for us to ponder. I don't think there's a simple answer. Millions of people go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington every year, and there's so many others as well. Courses that are taught, books that are read, films that are seen, and so on. And it, it has an impact on people's lives. It really does. People who leave, who write a message, it's true. Uh, and yet we have rising anti-Semitism. How do we make sense of this? I don't think it's receding so much uh, as certain kinds of politicization that Alicia mentioned earlier. That's what concerns me. And the ability to politicize something like that is horrifying, isn't it? To politicize the Holocaust is horrifying. I also always like thinking about the alternative. Better that a Holocaust is getting further away than one's coming closer. There's a question um, right on the on the aisle here. Um, I understand you're doing some work with Ariel Berger, and yes. uh, uh, as a result of his book *Witness*, that won the National uh, Jewish Book Award. And I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, the question was about Ariel Berger and uh, his book *Witness*. Um, I'm very pleased to be uh, the president of the Witness Institute, helping to sponsor Ariel uh, in building a new set of cohorts of students who are engaging in the way that my father's classroom was run. So what we've done is we have a, we had, we're already into our third cohort we're starting to plan, but every year we've had a group of 12 to 18, uh, usually post-grad students, people already out in the world, um, who didn't have the opportunity to learn with my father, who are learning and coming together, and it's Jews, non-Jews, all sorts of different backgrounds and pursuits, coming together to learn in the classroom style in which my father taught, um, and to build bonds with each other, to understand those values, and to become armed, to become witnesses themselves in the way that students who got to learn with my father felt they had been empowered to become witnesses for what they had seen and observed. Fallon, there's another question over here. Thank you both for being here. Um, I was wondering um, a little bit more on a personal level for both of you, how your own background shaped what you chose to do professionally in your life. I, I mean, for me, it's totally random. It's just a, it's, you know, stochastic random walk. You know, it's like, uh, I grew up liking computer games, therefore I wanted to program computer games. Uh, some guys from Wall Street kidnapped me and said, the market's the biggest computer game on the planet, come help us write it. I did that for 25 years. Um, had, you know, I was like a black sheep of the family. I didn't go into academia. I didn't do anything of substantial learning. So that, that, that's me. I think I was, uh, uh, we both went to the same school in New York City called Ramaz, which is an, an Orthodox day school, and uh, I, I didn't like it there. Uh, and I, you, it wanted, actually, you wanted to wear <laughs> pants, right? <laughs> it was um, a very strict, in my experience, is, I wasn't used to that. My parents never yelled at anyone, and the teachers would yell at the kids, and it, I didn't like it. So um, I was um, recovering from that school, let's say. But I think both my father and Martin Luther King, whom I met several times and, of course, heard give speeches, inspired me with a love of the Bible. And then I thought I would go into biblical studies, and I took classes, but I didn't like biblical scholarship because I felt that Bible scholars asked the wrong questions. And I, they had no sense of the poetry and the inspiration of the Bible and the beauty of the Bible. They're always looking to correct the text and figure out which passage came earlier than the other. And so, and it just wasn't interesting. That wasn't uninteresting to me. 
So I decided then that I, what I was interested in instead was really, in the sense, the pathology of biblical scholarship. Why do they ask the wrong questions? Why do they not have the sense of the beauty of the text? I remember once in a, in a graduate seminar that I sat in and the professor took a verse, some verse from the Psalms, I don't remember what it was exactly, but it's something to the effect of the gates of the city sing the praises of the Lord. And the professor said, obviously it's a mistake because gates don't sing. And he spent the next two hours, you know, amending the on the gates of the city were written the praises of the Lord. He was somehow make it rational. I don't know what he was trying to do, but I thought this is not for me. How how can these Bible? How can they read the Psalms and then ask those kinds of questions? And so I that became uh, actually the the field of my research of this. How did this come about? This kind of biblical scholarship in the 19th, 20th century. Another question. There's a question right in front, Fallon, on the second row up here. Um, OK, I guess for like a little bit of context for my question, I was raised Catholic and still am, but I went to Hebrew school for like three months when I was 15 um, for my friend's bat mitzvah. And I felt like I actually learned a lot more about being Catholic in Hebrew school. And I did Sunday school, which is interesting. But um, in, I guess, what you were saying about today's like climate and anti-Semitism on campuses, what is your advice for non-Jewish people to like take from both of your father's like works and teachings? Um, I guess going forward from here, now that this is something that's been like recognized and is being talked about. Could you repeat the question? Uh, the question is, and there was some context that went with it, the young woman attended for three months a Hebrew school because her friend was being bat mitzvahed, and I guess you were curious, right? Or it was, you were invited to do so? Yeah, she, they invited me to like be part of it. And Which is amazing, wow. Um, and and the, the question the young woman is asking is, uh, Professor Heschel and myself is, um, what do we think is the message from our fathers that a non-Jew, a young non-Jew today, should take with them? And specifically, how do you confront anti-Semitism in a college campus? And the same would be true, how do you confront racism? How do you confront anti-immigrant statements and sexism and so on? And you, you stop and you say, just a minute, what did you just say? What? Do you realize what you're saying? Do you mean that? And I think in a, in a low-keyed way, as actually, as Alicia said a few minutes ago, not to scream, yeah, but to stop and pause and just, just a minute. Do you know what you're saying here? How can you say that? Uh, and the way your father said, this is not your place, Mr. President. There's a way of speaking, and, uh, and I fully agree with that. I'll say two pieces. I think that the Jewish people throughout our existence have always been threatened by two forces. Those who sought to physically destroy us, like literally just kill us, uh, and those who sought to assimilate us, such as the Greeks and the story of Hanukkah. The idea that they're not gonna physically harm us, but they're, they're gonna squash who we are, what our identity is, until there's really nothing left. And I think that to be the best ally that one could be as a non-Jew to Jewish friends, obviously you want to always stand up against enemies who are there to destroy us. But in the same way that my father always wanted his Christian friends to be the best Christian they could be, his Muslim friends to be the best Muslim they could be, I think to express your curiosity among your Jewish friends, realizing that for many years since we've come to this country, the shift has been towards secularization and assimilation and a lack of knowledge, a lack of identity, a distancing of these things. When you ask a Jewish friend, hey, like what actually goes on at a Passover Seder, you're actually opening a door and inviting them to learn a little bit more about their own identity so that they can answer you. So it's not just about fighting those who want to kill us, it's also about helping to remind even those of us who've gotten distanced from where we came from that there's a lot of interesting things to talk about and explore there. Another question here. 
But why don't we start at the end here and we'll come in, okay? So. Thank you. Uh, I'm going back to uh, several questions before this. Um, I do interfaith work and I was very clear that when I woke up, I hoped, from brain surgery in Beth Israel, that I would be praying in Hebrew, and it was not gibberish. Uh, I hoped that I could, could get there, and that's a whole nother story. My sister, my one sibling on the other hand, is a born again missionary, and she teaches Bible study to, by saying the Jews, that monolithic group who has not changed since they crucified Jesus. You know, and that's the one time I will fight back <laughs> on my, with my one sibling. Um, and when I point out that there are numerous varieties of Judaism, just as there are numerous varieties of Christianity, the white evangelicals do not want to hear that. They don't want to hear about the differences within any acknowledgement of, of, of Jesus in any way or as Christ in any way or the combination. But that's again another. My concern, though, is not much with the white evangelicals right now, but with my progressive church friends. They forget to say when it was the Jewish authorities who didn't like the new folks were doing something. It wasn't the Jews. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So what's your question exactly, please? My question is how can we begin to address that so that the church can teach more precisely about what, who, were, who was staying with Judaism at the time of the early church, who was not, and, and I get, get to the nuances because it comes out to me as, as anti-Jewish. Okay, you know, can I make a suggestion? My suggestion is there's, an, there's a very helpful book called The Jewish Annotated New Testament. Mm -hmm with many articles and essays that deal with different volume, different books within the New Testament, but also the history, the background. I would get a copy of that, if I were you, and see if that can help you come up with some quick and easy responses. Okay. Thank you. The Massachusetts Thanks. Council of Churches is excellent at saying, this is the story. It's not your Jewish neighbors who live next to you. Yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. I think there's a young man here who... Um, both of your parents were, I guess, in the modern Jewish imagination, the foundational figures in Jewish political activism, at least in America. Uh, I'm in rabbinical school. A couple of us are in rabbinical school. Um, and I'm wondering what... Similarly to previous questions, what message your fathers would have um, for young Jewish leaders seeking to make an impact in a Jewish community that its self-understanding has changed? I, to give one more bit of context, I think my parents' generation sort of rests on the fact that, um, that Rabbi Heschel walked with Dr. King to kind of excuse themselves from doing a hard look at themselves and their place in society. And I would ask, what, what message do you think that they would uh, have for young Jewish leaders facing a Jewish community that is not always deeply involved in the difficult work uh, of social activism, even though it likes to think it is? Would one of you repeat the question? The question is, what would the message of our fathers be for young Jews who are embarking on a path of social activism leadership through the rabbinate uh, and other forms of leadership specifically to a community that is resting on your father's legacy it's sort of to excuse itself from difficult questions so 
So first of all, uh, I appreciate your question. And um, I guess if, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, I, I would say that I agree that too often people use the photograph of my father marching with Dr. King to pat themselves on the back. And Jews will say, yeah, look what we did. I can't stand that. I will also, by the way, just mention that the Selma March was in 1965. And I remember nobody was interested in those days. It took at least, mm, I would say, about 15 years minimum before people, I knew, Jews I knew, suddenly started saying, oh, that was a good thing. Hmm. It took a long time. But the point is that for my father, always, the question is the challenge. That photograph should be a challenge and not some kind of pat on the back. So his, his point was always that life is not a gift, it's a mandate. What are you going to do with your life? How are you going to contribute? Each person is unique, he emphasized. You can't actually just try to be, live your life like someone else. You can't be Jewish like someone else. My father, at the end of his life, wrote a two-volume book in Yiddish about the Kotzka Rebbe, a Hasidic Rebbe. I just visited his grave last week in Poland, standing all alone in a big, otherwise empty cemetery. But the Kotzker said that Judaism has to be authentic to who you are. And you have to know who you are. My father always said, it's not enough to be Jewish, you have to stand for, stand for Judaism. And he said, growing, basing himself on the Kutzker in his book, Man is Not Alone, my father wrote that to try to be Jewish like other, other people, to imitate someone else, like your grandparents, whatever, that would be spiritual plagiarism, which I think is a great phrase, spiritual plagiarism. You have to know who you are and you have to stand for something and your Judaism has to be authentic to who you are. So I would say that with that generation, or if you want to speak to others today, uh, they have to know who they are and be proud of who they are and what do you stand for and what are you going to do about it? And that would be the first thing I would say to them. Look at the world, this is yours. This is your one life, a gift, something very special, and it comes with a mandate. Alicia, do you want to? I guess I have, I have two thoughts. First of all, the Kutzk was even more severe, right? He said you have to be, uh, re-authenticize your Judaism every day. You have to like yes. daven differently today than you daven yesterday for it to be authentic. Look, my, my father, even at the end of his life, and he accomplished quite a lot, you should know he felt he had not done enough. So if he who had done all these things felt he had not done enough, how much more so should those of us who look to him and say, wow, you know, we should do that, um, we should do things. But I would also say that you know, both of our fathers, I think, had deep admiration for Hasidism. And there is a big piece of Hasidism also that you're supposed to like, work for a living and, and not just be ethereal in the world of ideas and, and even communal service, that also like, there is something to be said for being able to, to move forward and do the basics. So do what you need to do to have a family and feed your family. Like, it has to also be... You know, without these things, the life cannot stand. Please, okay, one last question. I'm sorry, in the front row, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Concerning education about the Holocaust at the high school and the college levels, do you have any thoughts about whether it is better to teach only the Holocaust, or to make it a part of something bigger and, and talk about genocide and racism and a lot of other bad stuff, or is the Holocaust sui generis and should it be taught only by itself? This is the mandatory hard question, right? <laughs> I actually I convened a session uh, at, at a conference, a Lessons and Legacies conference years ago to discuss this. Do we want a course on the Holocaust or a course on Holocaust and genocide studies? Or some people do in, in the government department at Dartmouth, this is a course on comparative genocide. And I, I, I don't know what your field is. I'm, I'm in 
I'm in the Department of Religion, but. I, I teach a couple of um, uh, edu education, uh, adult education courses on the Holocaust. I've done a uh -huh. biography of a survivor. I have a, my own opinion, but I want to hear yours. Um, if, if, okay, so you know that in, in the field of Jewish studies, there are also controversies. If we just teach the Holocaust, we're teaching about Jews being murdered. Well, where, where's the Jewish life? Uh, so should the Holocaust be taught by itself or is it in the context of Jewish history? On the other hand, what's horrific, the perpetrators. So do we want to teach about the Holocaust in terms of perpetrators? How could they behave this way? What does this mean philosophically and culturally for us? Yep, so there, there are different debates and different approaches that we take. And I frankly, uh, um, I, I want, when I've taught these courses myself, I do worry that my students, some students come away with the sense of only thing about Jews is anti-Semitism, is hatred of them, and I don't want that. I want them to understand something about the vibrancy of Jewish life in Europe that was lost. Human lives were lost. An extraordinary religious civilization was destroyed. I want them to know that. Uh, and I want them to take it inside of themselves and their hearts and minds and souls. I also want them to know something. I want them to, to go away with a problem, with big problems that can't be in any way resolved in a, in a classroom. I want them to come away with a, a huge bundle of, of deep concerns of how this could happen and what it means for us as human beings, all of us, each one of us, to think about over and over again. Alicia? My son wants to major in science. He's a junior in high school. And he had to choose at the beginning of the year, was he going to do AP Chem or AP Physics? And this was like a big, big decision. Of course, I don't know how many of us are scientists here, but like, there's a lot of overlap. Ultimately, when you understand how um, electrons jump from different orbital states, like you have to understand some physics to understand chemistry, yada, yada, yada. My point is, he made his decision based on the teacher. And I think that if I have to choose is organizing the curriculum in the most precise way the most important thing, or is it getting the content taught with teachers who are not reducing night to literary analysis the way this young man said he experienced in his public school, I would put the majority of my focus into raising the quality of how the topic is taught and what is the quality of the teacher and how are they provoking questions that are problematic, as Professor Heschel just said. And I would prioritize that for me over the what exactly is the best way to dissect it in the curriculum. I'm not saying it's one or the other, but for me, that would be my instinct, not as an educator. Please join what me in thanking, this? I'm oh. sorry, go on. Okay. I just want to say, you were going to say what your approach is. Yes, what is your view? I, I think the Holocaust should stand alone. There is so much that people need to know about it. It can take years and years to, um, to get even a, a slight grasp on on all of the implications of the Holocaust. So I think it, it would be dilutive to, to try to almost equate it with the horrors of like Cambodia or the, the Armenian genocide. They were very bad, but they, they just weren't the same. That's just my opinion. Please join me in thanking Suzanne and Alicia for an extraordinary conversation.